It's perfect. It's only 1031. Great. Okay, so we are live on Facebook as well. Should Great. we? Okay. Okay, so we are live on Facebook as well. Should we? Okay. Okay, so we are live on Facebook. Give us one second. I think we're good to go. <laughs> okay. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, and we have some sisters from the UK, so good evening to you. We're very excited to have uh, Judith Lewis Herman with us. Um, Judy, we don't need to introduce you. Everybody that we have watching is here watching because of you. But um, I want you to know who's watching. We have approximately between Facebook and um, the Zoom uh, attendees, 60 women, we anticipate that within the next five to 10 minutes, it will grow. And a third approximately are clinical counselors. A third are uh, frontline activists, fr feminist grassroots activists. And a third are survivors, mainly women who are callers, but others as well. And it's not mutually exclusive, uh, at least in our collective uh, as women in the world, most of us, if not all of us, have been victims to male violence. So some of the frontline workers or uh, the activists have been survivors of incest and other forms of male violence. And uh, to those of you who are new to us, um, we are the oldest rape crisis center in Canada. Next year, we will celebrate our 50th year. And I wanted very briefly to tell you a little bit about our calls in relation to incest. Um, out of the calls that we receive every year, approximately 1,200, 27% are from adult women who were sexually abused in their childhood. Of this portion, of this 27%, almost half were victims of incest, meaning the abuser was an adult family member or a very close family friend. And um, more than 80% of the women who call us are adult when they call us, but when the call is made when the victim of incest is still a child, it's often by her mom who trying to protect her. And um, when women do tell us about incest, 55% of them, the abuser was the father or a father figure like stepfather, mother's boyfriend. In 30% of the cases, the abuser was another adult family member like an uncle or a grandma or grandfather and the other 15% are a man who was very close um, family friend. And one of the key reasons we wanted to have this conversation with Judith public is because unlike other forms of male violence against women, rape and sexual assault, domestic violence or wife bettering, sexual harassment and prostitution, even though there is a debate about prostitution, there is still a public discourse about those mm -hmm. forms of male violence. And me too, of course, give a great boost to that. But incest is still has a, is not part of the public conversation. Last year uh, in France, there was Me Too incest movement that did not reach North America. So in a way, we're still breaking the silence when it comes to incest. So having this conversation public and having it available for the public after is our small attempt to try to interfere the denial and the silence uh, in relation to incest. Um, Danny, you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, obviously, Judy, thank you so much for being here. Um, your work is obviously extremely important um, on your field, but I would like to share with you that it has informed my crisis work so much, and it had given me the opportunity to suggest your book to the callers that I've been working with that at the moment, they are ready to do some reading like trauma and recovery. And um, they often, and I'm sure that Hila has suggested the book for her callers as well. And it's always the same, kind of the same feedback of like how uh, reassuring the book was and how like they could uh, finally understand a lot of the feelings they, and behaviors that they have after, um, after the trauma they've experienced uh, during their childhood. So uh, thank you so much for being here and the opportunity for us to have this like public education event, which is 
like Hila is saying, just so important to have, obviously we have clinical counselors here and feminists and activists, but it's important for survivors and also the general public. So thank you so much. My and just an, thank you for having me. Just a, an evidence of how far and wide you've reached. This is my Hebrew copies that I got when I joined the Request Center in Jerusalem in 1997. Mm -hmm. Don't know if you've seen the Hebrew translation. Um, we're gonna start with our first question and to the women who are watching us, we have prepared questions uh, in advance. We will try to incor incorporate your questions and your comments. Danny will monitor them and will bring them when, when it's possible. And our first question to you, Judy, is you credit the book Trauma and Recovery to the women's liberation movement. Can you speak to that? Uh, well, um, I basically credit my whole career to the women's liberation movement. Um, I started my psychiatric residency in 1970 shortly after I joined a consciousness raising group, Red and Roses Collective Number Nine, to be specific. Um, Red, Red and Roses was a radical feminist organization in the Boston area for a while in the 70s. Um, and so when I, when I saw my first patients, I started my residency on an, on an inpatient unit. Um, when I saw my first patients, I was listening with the same awareness that I had was I, as I was gain, that I was gaining in my consciousness raising group. And in a way, the, 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 the CR groups and, and the, the psychotherapy office had many features in common, including confidentiality and the ability for, you know, the, the mandate really for people to tell their stories and permission for them to have their feelings and to say the things that they were, you know, never dared to say. Um, and uh, it turned out my two first patients, were women who had been admitted to the hospital after making suicide attempts. And both of them disclosed history of father-daughter incest. And at the time, the, you know, the, the sort of psychiatric mythology was that this was a fantasy. My psychiatric textbook estimated the prevalence of incest is one case per million. So mm -hmm. that tells you how totally clueless they were. Mm -hmm. um, but I, be I believe them because what they were saying, first of all, the, the pathway from being abused as a child by the person they were, that was supposed to take care of them, that they were supposed to trust for care and protection was the person, the very person who was preying upon them. Um, it was very, it was clear how that could lead to a developmental pathway that would end up with the person feeling like they'd rather be dead. And um, that there was no, or that they didn't even deserve to live. And, um, and I, I, um, I wrote in. I had. A, I wrote in my journal that in, in, that I thought it, incest was the paradigm of um, patriarchal exploitation. Um, I. Uh, it seemed like I, I, I compared it to the the right of the first night that the feudal lord used to have over his subjects when. Um, as in the marriage of Figaro, when the, you know the Lord was supposed to uh, have the the first crack at the bride, um, uh, and uh, and and the other thing that happened was that when the patients started to talk about it, 
and they actually got support and validation and um, and weren't shamed or dismissed or blamed. Um, they got better. They started to recover. So that kind of launched the career. Um, yes, the, the fact that um, the book is called and your um, you everywhere you wrote and spoke about it, you have the notion of trauma and recovery is very crucial for the personal experience of women and for the political uh, principles that we as feminists um, follow women's oppression with a vision of women's liberation. And just that notion itself has gave hope to women because part of the abuse, so we're also told that they're damaged, yeah. that they're not worthy. So to know that there is a recovery, that they are whole and will be whole um, has been very, very significant for, for women survivors. Yeah. Um, there is a question about backlash. We will get to that from, from one of the women who are watching. Um, we have a big question for you. Uh, there is a parallel process that you do in the book um, while you speaking about the importance of truth telling in the process of the recovery mm -hmm. and um, unveiling and researching the core experience of the individual woman, you have done a similar process with unveiling and researching the core um, social uh, um, relations and professional psychiatric relation to incest, to the trauma of incest. So you, while you speak of the importance of truth, you're doing like a very good feminist, you're doing the practice of um, telling the truth and revealing the truth and exposing the truth. So a very big question is, and it's going to be impossible to say it in a few minutes, but uh, start with that. When you did your clinical research and um, the therapeutic work, what are the key themes that you found about um, incest? Um, well, of course, the first thing key thing we found was how common it was. Um, mm -hmm. I, after I finished my residency, I teamed up with Lisa Hirschman, our, my late colleague, when, who died way too young, um, who just, uh, she'd just gotten her psychology doctorate and um, she was seeing patients in her practice who, and we sort of looked at each other and said, wait a minute, you know, how this, this was supposed to be so rare. How come we're seeing so much? So we started asking clinicians we knew and with, you know, in, in, before long we had 20 cases just by asking around. Um, so, and we wrote it up uh, and, uh, uh, so, and we, we um, wrote this up for a new women's studies journal that had just started up. And they accepted it, but when we had the 20 cases. Um, but just, you know, between, with an academic journal, it takes a year or so between the time the paper's accepted and the time it's published. And in that year, and this was pre-internet, you know, this is back in the prehistoric times, um, the paper was copied and handed to, from one person to another. And we started getting letters from all over the country. And I thought I was the only one. I thought I was, you know, it was, I thought it was my fault. I, 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 I thought no one would ever believe me if I told. Um, and so that was the first finding, just how, you know, the pre this absolute, you know, underground prevalence that had never been recognized, you know, certainly not in the mental health literature. And um, 
And um, the, the other thing that we found in terms of the families at risk um, was that oftentimes one of the striking features of the family were, was that the mom was incapacitated in some way as a protective figure. Either she was battered herself, um, there was a lot of domestic violence, there was a very strong correlation mm -hmm. between child sexual abuse and domestic violence, and that all of this is since been validated with much bigger, much more, you know, um, by the book, you know, randomized, random sample studies and so on. Um, uh, battering uh, was a big correlate or maternal illness, either medical disability or mental disability. Um, or maternal death. Um, uh, and the other thing we found in the literature was that families where, where incest happened were supposed to, were socially isolated. And the stereotype was, you know, the fam, the, the, the family living on a back road with no tel you know, telephone and no car and, um, in the backwoods. Um, but first of all, this happened in every social class. So, it, you know, as, as, in, as in battering and everything else, the, the correlation with poverty was real, but it, it, it wasn't exclusive. Um, uh, but that isolation also wasn't just something that happened. It was something that was enforced by the mm -hmm. father. Um, that he, because, and, and this is true of coercive control methods worldwide, whether you're talking about torture or um, incest uh, or the sex business, um, you know, and pimping. Uh, you have one of the methods is to isolate your victims from any other source of social support and political prisoners know this by the way and they that's why they'll do things like go on hunger strikes to be able to get letters from their from home because you know they'll be told nobody you know nobody everybody's forgotten you everyone's betrayed you nobody cares about you um and they know that they'll succumb if they don't have um, connections to counteract the, you know, the, the coercive control. So, you know, as with domestic violence, the women are, were often, you know, they weren't allowed to work, they weren't allowed to see their friends, um, they, even their family members, they would be accused of, you know, you're just cheating on me. Um, and, uh, and the kids wouldn't be allowed to have friends over, they wouldn't be allowed to have, you know, go over to a friend's house, that kind of thing. Um, what else did we find? Well, that's probably enough for, I mean, then we found a lot about the symptom presentation. Right. Which, yeah, um, but I can imagine we'll get to that in some of your, your next right. questions. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, a few points um, that we know in all forms of mental violence, but it's particularly true to incest, is that the abuser um, is isolating the victim. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to incest, the fact that the child is forced, often for her survival, to keep the secret, it's also an element of that creates alienation and isolation, even when she's in company in school or with, with peers. Oh, right, right. She's not absolutely not to tell or I'll kill you or I'll kill your mom or I'll kill your your dog. I mean, right. You know, that's it's, yes. you know, that's yes. and some. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, yes, yeah, sometimes it's very blunt threats and sometimes it's uh, we know about men who told the girls, if your mom 
especially when the mom was struggling with cancer over yeah, over yeah. very yeah. dangerous oh, illness. Kill her. Yes. It'll kill she, her. You, like exactly. It will like yeah. that will kill your mom. So the, the mm -hmm. child had all this responsibility. And I also want to reinforce what you said about all classes. What we notice that when it's a functioning family, a middle class family, the difference between those families and the impoverished family who already some kind under ministry scrutiny is that the middle class is much better in hiding it. Yes, that's true with uh, substance abuse too, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, there was a very interesting study that was done by George Valiant, who was a professor here at Harvard, psychiatrist. He followed a, a, um, two groups of men throughout the life, life course. Um, one was the, the Harvard class of JFK, and the, uh, I forget what year it was, 1940 something, or, um, and the other was um, a group of uh, working class kids uh, from, you know, from a tough neighborhood. Um, and the rates of alcoholism were not, were comparable, but the, the working class kids hit bottom a lot sooner because they didn't have all the resources to hide it. So actually a lot of them got into recovery sooner. Right, good point. Also, I've, uh, we've been, we have women in our communities that have been in recovery, so we've been, in AA groups and when people come for poverty or from hard background, their rock bottom that push them for recovery. And there is the rock bottom of middle class people, or oh, I lost my car, I lost my house. The working class and the people never had a house and never had a car. So exactly. the impact is very, very different. Yeah. 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 yeah Judy, also you, you you were mentioned you were mentioning how like uh, the secrecy of like kids not revealing and everything about like the threats that the abuser themselves like uh, do against the kids and you're saying about like the emotional blackmail what we see too it's like women revealing to us that at the time of the attack when they're kids um they will like gift them gifts money whatever it is they, they will give it to the kid and then uh automatically the kid will like think that somehow like they're complying or oh, uh, absolutely. They, yes. they yes. accepted that that means that i can't tell because then i'm, I'm like responsible yeah because I'm, uh, I'm implicated and it, it's you know yeah i asked for it basically right yeah so um I we have a quote yes the please. intermittent rewards uh, as you pointed out is another of the methods of course of control right mm -hmm. Exactly. There is a question about backlash. So we want to hear, we know that women on the ground, as often they are when they hear the truth of their lives, responded uh, with a relief and acknowledgement and kind of reached out back to you. How did the institution of uh, psychotherapy and psychiatry receive your research? Well, um... I think that it was mixed, you know, on the one hand, um, yes, there's been backlash and resistance and, um, but we kind of expected that. Um, I was actually pleasantly surprised by the fact that, you know, I mean, here I am a professor at Harvard. I mean, um, that right. was not what I expected. <laughs> so, um, so I think there's also been some recognition, I mean, over the years that, you know, bringing the, the knowledge base and the wisdom of the women's movement into the academy was good for the academy. Um, right. You know, Kathy Amatnik, who changed her name to Kathy Sarah Child, who, oh, right. um, uh, wrote the the original piece on consciousness raising, described it as an empirical method of research, as well as a, you know, a, a form of activism, um, that by 
um, actually going to the people and hearing their stories and hearing the truth. This was finding out information that had been suppressed. Um, right. Great. I'm going to use this to do a PSA. We will have Kathy Sauerchild, the author of Consciousness Raising a Radical Weapon, for a public conversation for International Women's Day in March 2023. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought her up. Um, so, uh, I, sorry, yes. No, I just um, I just wanted to say, because obviously it's it's so important, like your research and all like all the other uh, women to the um, on the psychiatric field, uh, bringing feminism and the importance of the conversation about male violence, incest um, to the psychiatric field. We see from from our work that women are often medicated or misdiagnosed, um, while also dismissed about the violence that they experience um, as oh. kids, like ch the child abuse. Uh, the sexual child abuse they've experienced. Um, I've worked with women that have been to therapy and uh, psychiatric treatment for years, and they never felt uh, safe or welcome to talk about uh, the sexual child abuse. So um, what you do is just so important, but we still see that a lot of like professionals just turn, uh, just don't pay attention to that, don't, don't take into consideration when they're diagnosing or, or uh, going through the treatment with the woman. Oh, don't get me started. I mean, uh, yes, there's been change, but there's still in. It's not at all proportion. It, it's it's still very spotty. The the awareness and it, I I teach you know residents every year a, a little seminar on trauma. You know, I I start. I, they this should have been you know they should have had this course on day one. Mm -hmm. you know, this should be part of every training in every mental health discipline. And it's still considered sort of a specialty rather than absolutely the basics. So, right. And one of the, and of course, every gain that women make comes, there is a price. So now we've seen cases that the adult woman is believed um, about her child's exper experience and it's used against her like bettering men in the custody fight, use it to argue that she's not capable of parenting her children when she's ultra alert and committed to the fact that it will not happen to her own children. Yeah. Both the system and the father claiming that she's crazy because of what happened to her and she's not to believe and she's paranoid. So we are like really in every other game, there, we have to hold really, really tight because there is constant attempt to and undo it. It's the same with pornography. We yeah. um, mm -hmm. now it's been hailed as empowerment for women. So yes. every <laughs> yeah. So we see it really in every game. We have some seemingly basic questions, but we think it's important to know the the answers. So a third of the women who are calling us on incest um, call us very, very late in their lives. Unlike other, other sexual uh, assault in childhood, a lot of women will tell us about it in their early 20s even. They will understand how it impacted their life as young adults and they will call us. But when it comes to incest survivors, a third of our callers are in the 40s and 50s, sometimes 60s and 17s. And sometimes we are the first women that they ever told it to. So the question is why it is so hard to uh, victims of incest to tell. I, I think it has to do with um, the fact that this was the primary caretaker. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually gone on for years. It usually went on for years. And, um, and oftentimes, so it's shaped the whole, the, the whole developmental course of the person's life. Um, and oftentimes, this isn't true in, if, uniformly at all, but oftentimes um, 
there's beside there is a way in which this very special secret between daddy and the child um becomes a way um it gives the kid a very special identity. Um, uh, sometimes you'll see this in incest pornography. They'll talk about how the pharaohs of Egypt, in, 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 for, for royalty who are you know, semi-divine, incest is not only allowed, it's, it's required because they have to keep their specialness in this other realm that's almost otherworldly. Um, and, and so there will be both an idealized and a devalued way in which the person feels outside of the human, ordinary human community. Either you're sort of, you know, semi-divine royalty or you're, you know, you're the devil's seed. Um, and your 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 worst your and especially with those intermittent rewards, you are you are defiled. You are um, you have you are not you are subhuman basically. You're non-human. Um, you are in a special category. Um, and even like you have special powers, like if you tell your mother, it'll kill her. That this incest secret is so toxic that it's almost magic. Um, and you don't dare share it with anyone because either you will die or someone else will die. Right. And yeah. you know, when you're a kid, you believe that kind of stuff. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking, for example, um, of, of one survivor who said, she, um, I think she was in one of our survivor groups. She said, I think of myself as, a, as the sewer silt that a snake would breed upon. Mm -hmm. And when you unpack that image, this was a mom with three kids. She'd been very protective of her kids. She was a good mom, but she was chronically suicidal. And she had this fantasy that actually the only way she could really be of use to her children, you know, that they'd be better off without her, which, you know, was common when people are, are totally devalued themselves and feeling suicidal. And that the best thing she could do is drown herself in the river. And then the silt from the bottom, she, her body would decay, the silt from the bottom of the river could be used to grow vegetables to feed her children. And that would be the way she could nourish them. Um, so, uh, I, you know, that's the degree of defilement that people feel. Right. I think uh, when we know the real numbers of incest, it's just remarkable to think how many women are managing to function in the world. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the other thing that happens is that people learn to dissociate. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in fact, you know, some people really develop severe dissociative disorders. Most of people who have dissociative identity disorder have been are, are sexually abused in childhood, usually by a parent figure. Um, uh, and so they, I mean, the downside is it, it's a, not a good adaptation to life in, in, in an ordinary human community. But it's actually not a bad adaptation to being under 
course of control people in in you know concentration camps and political prisoners teach each other how to, to dissociate to withstand torture um mm -hmm. and so there can be you know a, a sort of a, a functioning part that learns how to fake it um at the same time that um and can be quite productive and well, and at the same time that the you know the other parts feel like if anybody really ever knew my secrets they'd lock me up forever you know mm -hmm. so i you know i'm i'm totally crazy and you know and, and i'm uh there's something fundamentally wrong with me um so uh, that so oftentimes yeah i mean sometimes survivors perform learn how to perform they, they're good in school they're good athletes they good girls um and can achieve quite high levels of um uh, productivity you know at the same time that their identity is is you know their inner lives are tormented right we um yeah it's interesting that you're you're um talking about dissociating and um how to um be functioning functional in our society and we see we obviously see too through our work how difficult it could be for some um uh, incest survivors to uh the ability to work to study to relate to people mm -hmm. to functional right. to function in general uh, and you wrote uh, uh, you wrote that woman compensating for the failures of adult care and protection with the only means at her disposal, immature system of psychological defenses. Yeah. You started kind of like talking a little bit about that. Can you speak um, a little bit more about this immature system of psychological defenses that might impact her adult life? Well, um... I think where this often breaks down is on um, issues of intimacy. Um, because, you, you know, if you really want to have a close relationship with someone, you can't be part, compartmentalized. You know, you, you, you want to share all of you. I mean, there are songs that go like that. Um, and so oftentimes when this, if I mean, there's another trajectory, of course, which leads into the bad girl, you know, um, acting out addiction, mm -hmm. uh, early pregnancy, re victimization, um, recruitment and, uh, into prostitution. I mean, uh, so there's the sort of the good girl adaptation and the bad girl adaptation. But the good girl adaptation tends to break down in in the when the in, the, in young adult life when issues of intimacy and identity are salient and you know oftentimes the collapse follows the breakdown breakdown of a relationship or um, uh, that sort of thing yeah um so you talked about dissociation and i think a close topic is the fact that when women do remember mm -hmm. the memory uh, we have women who know know that it happened but they have glimpse yes. and senses and in a terrible tragic irony the this fragmented memory, which is a strong evidence that she was abused, are used to discredit her. Yes. Because if you do not remember, and it happens also with rape victims, if you don't remember anything chronologically, it means that you were not abused, even though the opposite is true. Yes. Well, that, that's actually true of post-traumatic stress disorder in general. Um, I mean, dissociative amnesia is a feature of PTSD and dissociation 
predicts um, it predicts PTSD um, in, in the um, you know in the moment of trauma. People who dissociate are more likely to develop PTSD. Um, uh, it also predicts shame. Interestingly enough, we can talk more about that later, but um, uh, or it's correlated with shame. Um, but uh, it turns out that a study I did with my colleague Emily Schatzo, where we looked at we, we looked at survivors who'd been in our incest survivor groups and about, a th about 20 some percent of them had you know, global amnesia and then delayed recall. Um, mm -hmm. And it turned out that um, yeah, some people had continuous memory, some people had you know, fragments, but enough to have a narrative. And then some people had this you know, sudden return of memory after a period of complete amnesia. Um, it turned out the people who had had that, that uh, global amnesia were people who'd been abused quite early in childhood and where the abuse had been quite violent and where it had ended by sort of middle school. If it lasted into adolescence, people tended to have continuous memory. Um, but the, the, the early onset and the violence, the short duration and violence were the things that, that correlated. And the other thing we found was that most of the women in our group, and there are bigger studies that, 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 can, that also corroborate this, um, were able to find confirmatory evidence from mm -hmm. other sources. Right. Once they started um, actually talking to people. Either they had a sibling who remembered or right. a, you know, their mother knew, or um, they actually found documentary evidence like photos. I mean, right. um, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I mean, you know, there was a whole backlash movement, um, the false memory uh, people, um, who, by the way, we've never found the sources of their money, and I personally believe it's the sex industry. Um, Promoters? Uh, you know, the, it's an international multi, you know, trillion dollar industry. Um, and there were a lot of psychiatrists who were recruited into it, by the way. Um, they were the, you know, the, 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 uh, the old guard, the patriarchs. Um, yeah. We're tired of these uppity women, but um, uh, the, um, and, and they made a point of, um, I'm sorry, let me just, um, uh, they, uh, they made a point of um, disparaging survivors on the basis of the fact of delayed recall, um, but um, interestingly enough, What's turned the tide in the courts here um, is the neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Because we now have pictures, brain imaging of dissociation. Mm -hmm. And guess what? What goes offline is exactly the part of the brain that's uh, involved with narrative memory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and there are amazing you know uh, uh functional mris of people with you know who are in dissociative states that 
you know, traumatized trauma survivors in dissociative states. It doesn't have to be childhood trauma either. I mean, there's a one Ruth Lanius, who's one of the psychiatrists in the, in Canada, who's done some of this basic neuroscience work. Um, uh, has an image of a woman who was in an auto accident and who dissociated during the, you know, how time, if you've ever been in an auto crash or a near accident, people will say time slowed down and I felt like it wasn't really happening. And I, I you know, I, I didn't have any um, uh, emotional reaction at all until, you know, suddenly I kind of came, I was sobbing and shaking at the, sitting on the side of the road, you know. Um, this is somebody who, in the fMRI, hearing the narrative of her auto accident, went into a dissociative state. And sure enough, there it is, you know, memory and cognition are mm -hmm. detached. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you just show that when you show these pictures to juries, they get it. Right, right. Another element that we saw that is quite influential on the ability of the victim to remember or inability is that when the abuser is creating an alternative reality. Yeah. Closing the blinds yeah. or doing it in the basement or doing it in particular times that either the mother is away or the family is on a holiday or yeah. in the middle of the night when the kid is sleeping, not sleeping. They're, yeah, they're in an altered state to begin with. Yes, yeah. And you spoke about uh, how important it is and um, useful when women find corroborating evidence mm -hmm. and validation. And it's true. And many, many victims of incest, they are not even seeking that the abuser will ask for the forgiveness. They just want him to say it did happen. Yes. yes and in the, in the very, very, very rare cases, it does. It's very such rare. a relief. Yeah. Well, or it, it, um, yeah, I mean, we, we've, my colleague, Emily Shetso, who I mentioned, does a lot of work with survivors on family disclosures and family confrontations. And we really counsel people don't 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 go for it in if you're depending on the response that you want right to you know for validation because you're right. probably not going to get it so that's exactly what we say yeah yeah because so if you want to just speak your truth um then and and then if they admit it uh you know that's that's icing on the cake. That's great, you know, but they can, or they can admit it and say, well, yeah, you, you know, why are you whining about this now? Get over it, or you know, no big deal, or you always wanted it, and you know, you were such right. a sex pot. Um, so, the but way. but this might be a moment to say that that I, I've been working for quite a few years on the book that I finally got done and it will be out next March. Oh, wonderful. Oh truth and repair and it's about what trauma survivors how they envision justice mm -hmm. um and that's what they want they want the truth out there they want the truth to be acknowledged they want the not just the facts but the harm to be acknowledged more even by the community than by the perpetrator right, mm -hmm. um, right. and then they want the repair part you know, but they want the justice to be focused on them and what they need for their recovery. And they're not big on punishment. They're not big on forgiveness. They just want the perpetrator to be stop or be stopped from what he's doing, not right. do it anymore, whatever that takes. And, um, and then they want support and help for their recovery. Right. It's really simple. And you know, um, I think we all know, anybody who's watching, and I know you know, Judy, that the rates of the criminal justice system are appalling. Five, yeah. Only 5% from all sexual assault and rape reported to the police in Canada will get even to trial. Oh, maybe 20%. And, yeah, so in Canada, it's 5%. How many? 
How much? And out of the oh, get 5%, to trial, 5% or 20% yeah. reporting. Oh, right. The report, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. or 10%, it depends. And uh, women, when women choose to go to the police and we, they use us as advocate and we give them a very frank picture mm-hmm. on the likelihood or the lack of it to get justice, they're saying it doesn't matter. I want to know that I did what I can to protect yes. other yes. women. To stop this. That, yes. And for the women I interviewed for my book, that was the same thing they said was, you know, I, I, um, I just couldn't live with myself if he did this to somebody Again. else, you know. Right. And the number one reason we hear from women who is reporting on incest to the police is because they saw the man with another child. He has a yes. child or he has a girlfriend now that has a child. Yeah. So yeah. even though yeah. they know it's going to be a very painful and likely unsuccessful process, they're putting themselves out there yeah. out of yeah. solidarity yeah. with often unknown girls and women. Yeah, yeah. Well, and oftentimes in in incest families, the dad will start with the oldest kid or the oldest girl, but then he'll move down the line if she gets away. So oftentimes there'll be this, this bargain, like, okay, do whatever you want to me, but just don't do it to my little sister. Don't do it to my little brother. And it's, it's also... You know, boys are also victims. Um, yes, absolutely. And, In high numbers, um, yeah, as children, yeah. yeah. Um, and then she runs away and she knows what's going to happen. Or she plays possum. She, you know, fakes sleep because she really kind of hopes that, that maybe he'll leave her alone and go bother her little sister. And then, I mean, your next question was going to be, why do people feel guilty? I think yeah. that's one of the main reasons is that there's often been this implicit bargain that, it, it, you know, just the way battered women often stay in the relationship saying, oh, just, you know, children need a father. We need, you know, he's got the money. Right. Um, I don't want to break up the family. It's okay if he does this to me as long as he doesn't hurt the kids. And then by the time he does start hurting the kids, she's so battered down, she, you know, she doesn't fight back. Yeah. Although sometimes that's, that's exactly when she's putting her foot she down. She finally will draw yeah. the line and get out of there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause it's not about her anymore. It's about the children. But, but the last and I think most effective method of course of control including violence, is forcing people to betray their own moral principles and their own close relationships. So, you know, with torture, when you betray your comrades and, Mm -hmm. you know, with these kind of families, when you betray your family members, you know, and once that happens, people just feel like, I, I don't deserve to live anyway. I sh- you, you'll say, you, but, but you were coerced. I said, no, I could have allowed him to kill me. You know, mm-hmm. um, I should have been, I should have died. Mm-hmm. Um, and you brought up the shame. And I, I, I want to point out that the things that we did achieve is that now when rape victims and women, uh, better wives are calling, it's much less common that they carry shame. They actually yeah, know good, that something good, good, terrible good. happened to them yes. by this man, and it's not their fault. But it's not true with incest survivors. We haven't reached to them yet to no. tell them the shame is not yours. So can you speak to that? Well, you know, it's, it's the difference between single impact trauma and prolonged and repeated trauma, especially prolonged and repeated childhood trauma. Um, with, with a single impact trauma, if you can get to safe, the, the person who attacked you doesn't have total control of your life. You can get away, you know, with most date rate and that, uh, the most common sexual assaults are, you know, acquaintances, right? 
Right, someone from um, Armenia. Uh, so, I mean, uh, there's, so you can get to safety much faster. You can get to an alternative world much faster. You're not, you know, you're not imprisoned in that basement or wherever it is that he takes you to rape you every, mm -hmm. whenever he feels like it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're much, much you're, you're gonna be in a situation much sooner where you can find people who will, um, who will not take a, a contemptuous attitude towards you, who will not blame you, who will not shame you. Um, and shame is all about how you appear in other people's eyes. Right. Um, how, you know, so if you, and the antidote to shame is shared laughter, shared eye contact, smiling. Sometimes with my patients, if they can't bear to make eye contact, which a lot of them, you know, can't, um, I'll say things like, "Your look, you look to me, because it's hard to name it. People, you know, it's such an intense emotion, but people will be in the shame posture. And so it's, it's the submissive posture of, mm -hmm. you know, head bowed, eyes contact, eyes averted, um, uh, hiding, trying to hide face um, or, you know, closed in on yourself like that and i'll say you know you're, you look like you're you you look like you're in a in a shame posture in a, mm -hmm. in a position where you you're feeling could you be feeling i don't, sometimes i don't even say shame at first because it's too powerful where it's like mm -hmm. embarrassed or mm -hmm. um criticized or do you feel like i'm looking down on you in some way have i I, I see you react that way. I wonder if I've done something that makes you feel that I'm looking down on you or I'm um, uh, uh, not, uh, that, that I'm somehow uh, think less of you or not disrespecting you. Um, and then I'll say, you know, I know that these things are, you know, that you're carrying a big burden of shame and, but I, I and that can be triggered very easily, but I want you to hear, pay attention to my voice and let me know if you hear a tone of contempt or, mm -hmm. um, uh, and if you do, I want to know about it because I, it's not my intention. So, you know, and, and so you, you're doing relational repair and, and then wow. you, if, if they say, no, I don't hear that in your voice, you want to take a look at my, you want to sneak a look at my face and see if you see, you know, that a look of that I'm despising you or that I'm looking down on you. Um, and they'll sneak a look, you know, and then bit by bit, they'll be able to make eye contact. And that's how you heal shame. Um, uh, and the it's laughter, like, I mean, a lot of our incest groups, people laugh, they yeah. share, they like belly laughs. You'd never imagine it, but mm -hmm. um, because they have that sense they're laughing together, that it's, right. it's, it's a laugh of, of belonging and humor, you know, is one of the mature defenses, as they say, that, that helps people bear the unbearable. You know? Right. Heather, can you scroll up so we can see? So you just answer a question. Someone did ask about technical, clinical techniques to deal with shame. And you started talking about the power of grouping. Mm -hmm. And we seeing a, a tremendous, tremendous um, benefit, uh, including in relation to shame, because when women hear other story and they tell, through knowing how much this woman is not at fault, and has exactly. nothing to be ashamed of, they can take it back to them. Exactly. They also, also knowing that women with a similar shared experience are not damaged, are mm -hmm. not despised, so they can take it to them. And of course, as you mentioned, like 
it's the opposite of the betrayal. Like if you had the person who, the, the incest is such a violation and such a betrayal in the most basic human to human relations, the support group that is built on, on love and, and solidarity and sisterhood, and it's not corrupted by exploitation or ego or needs or control, mm -hmm. is, is the immediate positive mirror to the experience of the victimization. Right. Yeah, they, they very often, they're very grateful for, for being able to group with other women with similar stories, or even sometimes when it's not necessarily incest, but yeah. just the fact that they're all sharing their experiences of violence with each other That's and right. sharing like what have worked for them in the past to be able to go through some uh, period of crisis and, and um, things like that. I want to read a comment on our Facebook that says, Judith Herman's book saved my life. I want you to uh, hear that. I'm honored. I think partly, um, Judith, it's not just because it's a brilliant book that speaks the unspeakable, names the nameless. I think the person that is political, your love and compassion to women, even though it's through a written word, do come across. Mm -hmm. Women feel loved by you. Mm. So I, it's a really, really great gift, the book that you wrote, and we can't wait for the next one. And I'm going to manipulate you to agree that once the book is out, we will have another conversation. Just, oh, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so stay tuned, everybody, because we will have a conversation Perfect. once this book is out. There is a question to you from uh, the women who are watching. Um, and it's about terminology and the use of terminology. Is it better or not better to use the term incest or to use as, as violence or sexual violence? Because I think some people are worried that incest is neutral. Um, it doesn't say who the attacker and who is a victim, although I believe that there is such a common understanding. It's kind of a code name mm -hmm. when we do. But is there a terminology that you judge is useful and a terminology that is better not to use? in the personal and the political context? Uh, yeah, I think there are pros and cons for both. I mean, I, I, I don't, um, I mean, not all incest is violent, or at least not physically violent. Um, a lot of the coercion is, you know, I mean, violence is a tool of coercion and, a lot of times the dads don't need to use it um, right you know or or the vi or oftentimes the survivor the incest survivor is spared the violence that is, is used against the other mem family members right um there's a a, a a lovely book out um by um here actually i'll show you Hold on one sec by a survivor Um, a survivor named Rosie McMahon, mm -hmm. who was actually one of the people that Emily and I worked with when we were working at a free women's clinic. Um, and I'm I'm revealing this at Rosie with Rosie's permission. She she was one of the people who I interviewed for the new book. Um, but, you know, there were four kids in the family and she was the one singled out for incest and she was the only one who didn't get beaten. Mm -hmm. And so, um, at this, by the way, this is one of the cases where there was a family confrontation and the father did admit it and apologize, which mm -hmm. is, um, but it took years of preparation. So, it, you know, right. um, but it's a very, it's a great story. It's put out by She Writes Press. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, and it just came out I, this year. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, 
So she was, that's one of the, the, the other family members resented her. She right. was, you know, she was blamed because she was the favorite, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and what a price she paid for being the favorite. And what a price she paid, yeah. exactly. And, you know, uh, so uh, one of the first things we, Emily did actually was get the girls together to become a little support group. <laughs> Um, right. they, and they found their way to us through Al-Anon. So oftentimes uh -huh. that's, you know, it's another grassroots um, movement, basically, mm -hmm. um, that I think has saved a lot of lives. Um, uh, anyway, um, so not all incest is, is violent. And not all sexual violence is incest. And um, so it, it kind of depends who you're talking to. You know, I, I think with people who don't get it, um, uh, you, you do want to sort of point out how coercive it is and right. how damaging it is. And, um, but, you know, they mean slightly different things. Right. So about terminology, there is a, a com long comment. I'll try to summarize it about the overused and inappropriate inflation of the uh, in North America in terms like triggers and trauma. And it's now being used about everything and anything, which is kind of um, watering down the real experience of trauma and the real meaning of triggers so i think yeah. that's something you want to mention you want to say something to that well, the one way to think of it is that there's big t trauma and there's little t trauma okay. you know <laughs> there's um uh and one of the things we looked at when we were trying to get this diagnosis of um originally into the diagnostic manual was whether people developed PTSD after, you know, life crises like bereavement, you know, bereavement, um, a divorce, losing a job, um, that kind of thing. And the answer was no. Mm -hmm. I don't. <laughs> you know. Um, on the other hand, if you are already, you know, if you are dealing with intergenerational trauma and ongoing oppression as part of a subordinated group, um, and then you're constantly dealing with microaggressions, you know, you're, uh, they, you know, sort of, why are they so oversensitive, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, it's not, it's not the one insult. It's the cumulative effect of right. multiple levels of oppression. And that, so, so I think, yeah, it's the use of the word trauma has been kind of, uh, it's gotten blurry, but I think that's the price we pay for wider awareness. Right, right. And um, we have a question from the audience. If incest impact boys, children differently uh, compared to girl children, I assume mainly when girls and boys reach adulthood. Uh, the answer is yes. And that's true for child sexual abuse in general. Um, and it's kind of in the ways you'd predict. Um, girls tend to have the more internalizing self-blame, depression, self-harm, um, uh, all that kind of stuff. Boys tend to act out their, their hurt and anger. You know, they get misdiagnosed as having ADHD, have, you know, uh, being, you know, bad boys, basically. Um, uh, getting the, you know, getting into fights, that sort of stuff. Um, 
being having trouble in school, uh, that sort of thing. Um, it sort of amplifies gender differences, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, interestingly, though, most and there's a kind of a I think of it as an urban legend, but it's also very much part of the you know mental health professions that abused kids become abusers. It's not true. Um, and that survivors really need to know this. Most survivors do not become abusers. They're in fact determined um, not, you know, this is gonna stop with this generation. And it's true that boy survivors because have grown up are, are a little more uh, statistically more likely to become abusers, but most of them do not. It's also true, by the way, that most abusers were not abused as children. That's a big mm -hmm. myth. Um, right. Because we don't, the truth is we don't know because they've never really been studied in the, at large in the community. They've been, you know, the people who've been studied are people who are in prison who are like the 0.1 or 0.1% of abusers and who are not exactly what you'd call a representative sample. And most prison, People who are in prison, both poor women and men, have childhood abuse histories. Mm -hmm. So that's not it. Um, right. I mean, women are mostly in prison for, you know, nonviolent offenses, and most of them have abuse histories too. Um, right. th there's one study that was done in the 1980s with abusers at large in the community. They were found through the, you know, um, advertising and word of mouth. And so they're not a representative sample, but at least they're, you know, the 99.9% the .9 who are out there who never get caught. And, um, and they did very thorough diagnostic interviews with these guys uh, and very thorough histories in general. Most of them had no childhood abuse history and no psychiatric diagnosis. Right. Certainly not major mental illness, not alcoholism, not personality disorder. Basically, you know, this was the Hannah Arendt scenario. These were ordinary, ordinary looking people. Um, right. And uh, so, anyway. Is it, it's it's interesting that um, I know that you have that in your book too about like not necessarily um, it's not true that um, boy survivors will become abusers or anything like that. But I've seen all my all my crisis work that some woman some woman um, coming from like violent violent marriages mm -hmm. they justify his violence because the man has revealed um, like child abuse. Right to her, so she very often. Um, I've I've heard from multiple women just like justifying, but you know, like he's been through a very tough childhood and had experienced yeah, right. violence himself, sexual violence himself. So I I can understand. So it's um, it's a very it can't help um, it. Yeah. yeah yeah. Also, we're strong strong believers that men can change. Oh, they yeah. just need oh, yeah. to want yeah. to. Yeah. 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 Um. There are, everybody sees families where there is an intergenerational pattern of violence and right. abuse, but they're not the majority. They're just very right. striking when you see them because, um, you know, it's, it, it, it is like this. Um, one of the people I interviewed for my book talked about how, you know, it, his, it was her father's kingdom and mm -hmm. then her, her brother inherited the kingdom, and so he all abused all the, the sisters and nieces, of, you know. Even though he and he'd been abused himself, you know. So right, so, um, there is but, a construction of designing the next abuser. Right, right. Um, Should let's look at the questions. This one is there is no way I can capture it. So if we can go up or down. So, um, I yes, I have a question. Um, 
Judith, you quote, uh, I think, Diane Russell on your book. Yeah. And I think we have um, um, our data to own. Like a lot of the women um, are calling us um, in relation to like a current viol violence that they've experienced are experiencing uh, in their relationships or mm -hmm. um, some sort of like sexual assault. And then later on, they reveal uh, being survivors of incest as well. Right. And yeah. you quoted yeah. her, you said, um, risk of rape, sexual harassment and bettering is approximately doubled for survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Why is that? Can you talk a little bit about it? Oh, sure. And there, those data are very strong, by the way. They are that's been confirmed with multiple studies. Um, uh, I think there, there's not just one explanation. I think maybe a shorthand would be saying that if you've learned that violence is the price of love, the price you have to pay, um, then you, have never learned how to protect yourself or that you deserve to protect yourself uh, or certainly that you can protect yourself. Um, what you've learned is that um, you can either be a victim, a perpetrator, a useless bystander, or a rescuer. And a lot of times people will desperately search for a rescuer. Um, and that's how pimps recruit young women for prostitution. For example. Call me daddy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love you, I'm gonna take care of you, I'm gonna protect you, you are very special, uh, you know, and and they mostly recruit from, uh, I mean, they can spot a survivor um, pretty, they know what to look for. Right. Um, you know, I, I mean, plus if you've, if you've got a teenage runaway, mm -hmm. you've got a pretty good bet. And, you know, if you've got that dissociative stare, you know, right. Um, We've seen almost. cases of, of pimps uh, waiting for young girls, for young women, uh, teenagers near foster homes, near the near foster, foster group. homes, yeah, or near bus stations where they, right. you know, took they took a book, uh, a bus to, you know, uh, to the nearest city to get away from home. Um, yeah, near near. Uh, uh, yeah, they know where to look for vulnerable girls. And um, and somehow it seems like predators generally know. I mean, I think most people don't recognize the dissociative stare, but I think predators do. And, um, and then right. you, know, you, you promise the moon and you promise love and safe and safety and safe attachment and care, the care the kid never got, the protection the kid never got. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, won't you do that? If you want to prove you love me, won't you just do this one little thing for me? You know. Um, so, um, so yeah, the revictimization data are incredibly strong and frightening. Um, and um, Again, um, you know, having a support group is pretty good protection, right? But not a rescue. You know, I mean, in a group, uh, this is a, another pitch, really, for groups. Um, and here, I'll show you. This is our. Uh, this is the model of our survivor group, our stage mm -hmm. two survivor group for people who. We have a stage one group also for people who are just learning about trauma and they don't go into depth about their, you know, but um, uh, that was called, um, what was it called? Um, uh, 
anyway, they're both put out by Guilford. Um, I mean, one of the other nice things about group is that it really models a, it's, it's like a bridge to a community, you know, it, it, it takes people out of isolation right. um, and it gives bridge to a safe community. Um, and it, 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 because group, group members have a lot of compassion, as you pointed out, for one another, they just don't have self-compassion. And mm -hmm. we actually, in a very structured way, you know, after people share a part of their story, we have, we ask people to give feedback, um, which is often very empathic. And then we, and we actually, we sort of coach them on how to give empathic feedback. So it's not just, oh, this happened to me too. And let me tell you about me. It's, and I feel so bad for you because, you know, I absolutely know nothing you did there. You were a kid. Nothing you did would have stopped this. And, you know, at least you survived. Um, and then before that person's kind of time is up, we kind of challenge that person to take in the feedback mm -hmm. and actually say, no, 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 but I'm different because blah, 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 you know, I, I, you know, no, you're not to blame, but I, blah, blah, and then there's more, you know, but I did this, or I did that, or I actually felt pleasure, God forbid, you know, and, um, so, uh, so, so we ask them to actually not push it away, but see what it would feel like to take it in, um, so yes, groups, um, big part of very helpful for recovery. Um, right, that's ex very consistent to, with our work for sure. Yeah. Judy, you just, you just mentioned something now. I know we have like uh, a few questions from... I will say that there are questions about books that you mentioned and books that you didn't mention. We will not deal with it now. We will, we will collect all of jo Judy's recommendation and we'll post them on our website in okay. a few days. So uh, we're not gonna spend uh, the precious minutes that are left to answer to these. We have a few more things that we're hoping to touch. Uh, but Judy, if you just mentioned I, I, I will have to stop at three, I'm sorry, so. Yes, no, we're committed to finish in six minutes. Okay. Six minutes, wow, okay. <laughs> you, I, I, just, um, I just want to, um, you to comment. I don't know if, it, if there's a way to be in brief, so go ahead. With okay, the so the three last points we wanted to mention is um, we, the power of group, half of the women who tell us about being victims to incest are actually being either resident in our house, so there is a kind of a household of grouping, or have a relationship with us on, um, in the support groups that we have for other forms of sexual violence, or they meet with us. We always meet two of us, at least with a caller, so we have a little group, the three of us. So half of the women who told, told us and tell us about incest first had relationship with us on other forms of male violence. So once we have the trust, right. they expose it. Uh, we wanted to discuss, but we're just going to say that um, the things that we are lacking as a society, like we have come to the fact that there is growing knowledge, mm -hmm. growing acknowledgement of incest. What we are utterly lacking is accountability not just for the criminal justice system, but through the society. And this is our role to create as feminist alternative cultures an alternative community that hold men accountable. They do not need to sit in prison for that. And the last point that I will actually say, and then I hope you will say something about it, is you wrote that uh, the women who recover most successfully are those who discover some meaning in their experience that transcendent the limit of personal tragedy. Most commonly, women find this meaning by joining with others in social action, which is basically a call to action for women to join the women's movement or other activism. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yes, um, Robert J. Lifton, who interviewed the survivors of the 
atomic bombing of Hiroshima, uh, actually coined the phrase survivor mission. And he found that the, the survivors who re did recovered well were people who felt like they they made meaning out of their experience by saying, I have to, we, we have to tell the world. We survive so that we can tell the world about the threat of nuclear weapons and what they actually do. And I think there's a similar, um, I mean, the, the people who make some larger meaning out of their personal tragedy don't feel so alone and they can join with, it's a way to join a larger community. Um, uh, in terms of prevention, I of incest, particularly, I think anything that empowers women and particularly mothers um, is incredibly important. There are very good prospective longitudinal studies now, including one by a psychologist named Carlin Lyons Ruth from uh, my hospital following the effect of early intervention with high-risk moms um, where um, they have, it's basically home visiting once a week. And in Carlin's study, it was just from when the, when the kid was referred to the study till 18 months. Some of the other ones that use nurses, um, go till two years, but, you know, or a little or longer, but even go just that, you know, first year, first 18 months. And it didn't have to be social workers, trained social workers. It could be community women who had a reputation as good moms who got a little training and supervision. They did just as well as these social workers. So this is a cheap intervention. It should be available to every first time mom, but certainly to teenage moms, to moms with depression, you know, to any mom who's in a high risk situation. And the job of the home visitor is first of all, to nurture the mom so that she can and take, care, and take care of the mom so she can take care of the kid mm -hmm. and, um, and get her whatever she needs. I mean, if it's a restraining order, help her get a restraining order. If it's housing, housing. If it's food, food. You know, um, very basic right. stuff. And at the mm -hmm. same time, modeling, you know, safe attachment, which so many of these moms have never experienced. So, mm -hmm. you know, if your kid is having a temper tantrum, it's not because he's been possessed by the devil or because he hates you. It's because this is what happens with toddlers. Right. And here's what you do to kind of chill out a tantrum. Um, and, you know, he doesn't need to be beaten and punished. Um, this is what you do. And, and then they looked at, she actually looked at videos of attachment. There's a way to even measure safe attachment between in, in, infant and, mom, and caretaker at 18 months and with the, um, and then later on too, the moms that got the intervention were able to form safe attachment and the trajectory of the kids, I mean, it was a randomized controlled trial. Some kids just got pediatric care as usual. The, the trajectories of the kids who got the intervention looked fine. The right. trajectories of the kids who didn't, all the things, you know, trouble in school, trouble making friends, trouble in adolescence, um, school dropouts, early pregnancy, mm -hmm. the whole bad girl track um, or bad boy track. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and depression, self-harm, Right. suicidality um so this is a preventable problem and we yeah. know how to do it right and it's what you yeah and what you're describing is intervention through sisterhood and solidarity that's right 
Yes, and I will, because we did promise you to end in 90 minutes. So the video will be available after us on Facebook. So I do want to tell the individual women who are watching now and will watch the video after, you do not need to be alone. Our crisis line, 1-604-8212, is available 24 hours. You don't even have to tell us your name. It's completely confidential. And we have a particular expertise on connecting women to groups, uh, helping set up some kind of group, even if you're not in Vancouver, even if you're not in Canada, we have our alliances and sisterhood reach far and wide. So just do not stay alone. And thank you all for joining us. Judy, this has been a privilege and an honor. We're really, really grateful for your work. You have been serving many, many, many women. And, and now I think three generations of women. So, um, to be continued. It's just the beginning of conversation. Yes, thank you, yes, thank you for having me. Shabbat shalom. And thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Bye-bye. Take good care. You too.